we, gaan, uh, we will now have a uh, Skype presentation done by uh, Peter Franken. He is uh, from uh, Safecast. Safecast is uh, uh, an organization he started one, one week after the Fukushima disaster. He started walking around uh, measuring the, the radiation measurements and uh, soon after that all kinds of other people joined the club. So now they even have an office. So, uh, but he will, uh, I guess, uh, tell more about it. So, uh, uh, Peter Franken is now in Japan. So that's the reason why we are doing it through Skype. So, um, Peter, you can uh, start. Uh, please in okay. English, if possible. Oh, absolutely, no problem. Okay, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be joining the, the Software Freedom Day today. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Bas. Uh, I would like to talk today a little bit about uh, what we're doing in Japan, and uh, most of the, the work I'm going to talk about is my volunteer work, and it talks about what we did after the uh, major earthquake that happened uh, in March uh, 2011, about a year and a half ago, and specifically, uh, my focus has been on how to uh, deal with the nuclear disaster from a, a citizen science perspective. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Before that, I'm going to quickly, just one second, I'm going to uh, switch to my presentation and uh, just a moment. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so as you, most of you uh, know, on March 11, 2011, we had a huge earthquake. But the major disaster that was triggered by it was the Fukushima nuclear plants uh, that uh, consequently blew up and caused a tremendous amount of contamination. Uh, across a large part of uh, North Japan. Uh, I was, uh, at the time in Japan, I went to the earthquake, I was in Tokyo, and what happened is, is that uh, the day after the earthquake, basically the first thing was, is, you know, what, what is happening, you know, uh, being from Holland, uh, I still have memories of what happened in Chernobyl, and the first reaction is, is you know, what, what is the radiation fallout, how much is it, uh, what to do with my family, etc. But the, the major problem was, is there was no information available in any format that was usable. Most of the information that was there was uh, uh, collected by universities for very different purposes, not for measuring contaminated uh, uh, lead. So, so what we uh, what I did is, is together with uh, two uh, uh, two friends, uh, we connected on the internet the next day after the, the earthquake to talk about how could we collect data, put it on a, on a website, and start disseminating based on a clearinghouse of data so that everybody could see what, for example, the government is seeing or other people are seeing. Uh, so. Uh, we actually, in a week's time, built a website, had a method, and then we started to collect data, and very quickly we saw that there is no data. So we had a, a beautiful website with a map, but there was almost nothing on it. And what was on it was highly inconsistent, or was way too far from the plan to be of any use. And the data we had in Tokyo was trying to measure cosmic background radiation, not uh, the radiation that was at the, at the level where we live as humans. So, uh, we said, okay, if we can't get the information, then uh, the next thing we did is uh, let's buy Geiger counters and let's uh, distribute these Geiger counters to um, as many people as we can, have them collect data about ready and upload it to our website. So then we run a Kickstarter campaign, it was very successful, with money, but then uh, by the time we had the money, all the Geiger counters in the world were sold out, so we couldn't get Geiger counters to give to people. So we basically were, after three to four weeks after the disaster, we were sitting in a room on a big Skype call. We were debating as to you know how we're going to solve this puzzle. Uh, so the, the problem was is that uh, very few devices exist. So what we did is we said, okay, we all uh, you know we all have different skills, and you know we had people on our team that were hardware designers, software designers, people that could organize things very efficiently, people of very extreme skills in the internet. Uh, we had people that were manufacturers of devices, and we put all we put all the people together through the Skype, call, and we said, let's make our own devices. Uh, put them on a car, and uh, the reason for that is, is we had only very few sensors, so by driving around, we could dramatically multiply the power of one Geiger counter by using it many, many, many times in measurement locations, uh, get volunteers to drive the device around, uh, get the data back, and put it on a map, and, uh, well, do it really fast. Uh, because at that time, we were three weeks after the accident, uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, panic or, or worry what really what was happening, and we really wanted to get some idea of what is, what is, uh, what is out there. Um, so this is, you can see a picture of uh, all the people in the room, and there was a huge Skype call happening. We used a uh, tremendous amount of social networks, uh, Skype, uh, Google+, uh, 
uh, Google Talk, all kind of things connect, started to connect people in Japan and outside of Japan to focus on this product. Uh, so we started with three people. Uh, one person is Joe Ito, he's currently the MIT Media uh, Lab Director. It's Sean Bonner, he's a, a, a leader of the press space in LA. Uh, in Tokyo, myself, there's President Akiba, he founded the Tokyo Hackerspace here. We had Billy, he's a famous MIT uh, graduate who's famous for hacking hardware. We had uh, the Dean of Peer University. We had Ray Ozzi, the ex CTO of Microsoft. And we had a few other people that started to talk about how we could do it. And before we knew, we had lots and lots of people trying to solve this problem. Um, so more and more people joined uh, our, uh, our effort and we started to get, get focused. So as I said, is this, the, the first thing we did is literally in about six days, uh, out of nothing, we built a, uh, a system that could be connected to a computer and uh, had a GPS mode and then could collect data. So what I want to do now is, is and Buzz, if you can help me, it would be great. I would like to show you a small video uh, this video was made by uh, the uh, equivalent of the NOS journal uh, in uh, in the US, uh, PBS News Hour, and they came uh, they came here about a couple of months ago, about a year ago, and they made a small um, uh, feature about how and what we do and how we went about. So, Bas, if you can uh, switch it on, then I'll I'll stay. Okay, I'll start the for the movie. Uh, yeah. um, Maybe an idea if we, during the movie, stop the desktop sharing, or not? Well, yeah, I'll do that. Now, tracking the spread of radiation in Japan eight months after the tsunami caused a nuclear accident. Japanese people are using new technology and the power of crowdsourcing to find hotspots. Here's our science correspondent, Miles O'Brien, as the second in a series of stories from Japan. In Japan these days, you never know where you're going to find a hot spot. We are at a highway rest stop, halfway between Tokyo and Fukushima, and we're looking for the kind of hot spot you just as soon avoid. It was on the roof, the cesium didn't really uh, stick very well, so it all flushed down and when it hit the concrete or the stone here, it bombed it. So this is like a micro hot spot. It's just another Sunday drive for Peter Franken and his SafeCast team of volunteer radiation contamination gumshoes. Using inspiration, perspiration, sensor technology, and the internet to paint a much clearer public picture of the Fukushima fallout. It is crowdsourcing of science in action. We're about 60 kilometers to Fukushima. We should be there in about an hour. We should be there around 12.30. We were heading north to the evacuation zone around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, about 40 miles away. We gather radiation readings in the air and on the surfaces with Geiger counters in and outside of the vehicle. Using a handful of devices, we measured raw radiation levels, counts per minute, as well as Becquerels and micro sieverts, which calibrate the raw numbers to their impact on human beings. So the Camilla servants and CPM consider considerably lower than they were just a few minutes ago. Sean Bonner is one of the founders of SafeCast, an all-volunteer organization that has plotted the most detailed maps of radiation contamination in Japan since the nuclear meltdown in March. Radiation doesn't fit that nice, nice, neat little disc right. that they want to paint on a map, right? right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. It, it, radiation it, isn't looking at a compass; yeah, <laughs> it's radiating very, outward. It's a very arbitrary thing. Yeah. There's like wind and topography and <laughs> this crazy stuff that ends up playing into it. Wherever they go, they draw a crowd, a curious, nervous, thankful crowd. In a restaurant parking lot in Nihonmatsu, about 60 kilometers from the nuclear plant, we met Hiroko Ouchi. I'm worried about my children and grandchildren, she told us. Thank you for measuring. Thank you for your hard work. The government doesn't release the accurate figures of radiation. Thank you very much. Thank you for working so hard. Thank you. But it's not just a lack of data. There is also a tradition here of not sharing it. Japan is notoriously bad about certain types of transparency, and it's not. this isn't a new thing. That TEPCO covers things up. Joey Ito sparked the birth of SafeCast in the desperate days right after March 11th. Director of the MIT Media Lab, 
He naturally took to the internet to try to stay abreast of events in his home country. The scarcity of reliable information prompted him to reach out to experts all over the world. Things snowballed very quickly. Within days, we had an email thread that turned into a Skype channel where all of us were constantly there talking and it really became kind of like a cross between a, 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 a sort of government situation room and newsroom where we were collecting data and just sort of putting new things out and just trying to get everybody involved that we could and it just kind of took a life of its own. We, we started to realize how important it was when it turned out that the government wasn't releasing data. The day before we took our drive, SafeCast volunteers offered up a seminar on radiation detection in Tokyo. It was standing room only for the talk, and many stuck around to get some advice on how to accurately measure the radiation around them. Many SafeCast volunteers come from the computer hacker community. Their intuition and ingenuity led them to design and build some novel devices to gather radiation data. Akiva, he doesn't use his surname, showed me what they call a b guide. What does that stand for? Uh, bento Gaigi. So when we originally designed it, we tried to design it to be like roughly the same form factor as a bento, so that's easy to carry around. Like a, a bento is a Japanese lunchbox. But instead of sushi, this box contains a Geiger counter, a GPS receiver, and an SD card. It costs $850 to build, but SafeCast is making them available to volunteers for free. During our drive north, the SafeCast team delivered a bigagi to Hideki Washiyama, who lives about 90 kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi plant. It's hard to get a high-quality Geiger counter, he told me, but I don't want to use cheap devices made in China or Korea. There are plenty of cheaply made, yet disturbingly expensive, Geiger counters in Japan. The Fukushima meltdown created an instant global shortage of good quality sensors. Concerned people in Japan and elsewhere sparked overwhelming <coughs> demand. Dan Scythe produces good quality Geiger counters in Sebastopol, California. He says that the shoddy devices so commonly found in Japan are extremely dangerous. Because people are waving these over their food and thinking the food's safe to eat, or they're, they're thinking that where they're living is safe and safe for their children to go to school. So it's, yeah, I think it's almost criminal to produce things that don't work. Scythe's small company is shipping out as many Geiger counters as it can, giving priority to Japan and specifically SafeCast. Volunteer Joe Barras says more comprehensive monitoring is the first step to understanding the real danger. I don't think that uh, ordinary people can make uh, a good valuation of the risk because even the specialists are in quite a bit of disagreement as to what the real risk is. And so the reaction is, I want none. If you don't know, give me zero. Right? Well, everybody agrees, no matter how, I, I, you, you can't find anyone who doesn't agree that lower is better, that less radiation is less harmful. Ironically, much of what we know about the effects of an acute dose of radiation comes from studying Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors. But radiation contamination at the level found here is a ticking time bomb with a fuse that burns for decades. There is no question ionizing radiation alters human cells, which can cause cancer and genetic defects. But how much exposure and for how long? The science, like the readings, is all over the map. This is the town of Minami Tsushima. We're about 28 kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi plant, about one kilometer from the police barricade announcing the involuntary exclusion zone. This area, 20 to 30 kilometers, is a voluntary exclusion zone, and you don't see anybody around, for good reason. Yeah, this is very high here. Really high. We're looking here at a uh, air, you know, one meter, around 7.2 to you know, between 7 to 8 microsieverts per hour. We're looking here at around 24,000 pounds per minute on the 10K and about you know, roughly 800,000 decoropters per meter. It's about 25 times if you see in, in Tokyo on the surface. It was five microsieverts per hour, most likely cesium-137, which has a half-life of 30 years. It's the equivalent of six chest x-rays every day. 
Not a problem for us to be here for a short while in street clothes, but how long before people could live here again? If you want to get this down to levels uh, that are considered normally to be safe, which would be under 0.3 microsieverts per hour, you would probably look at uh, much more than uh, 20 years or 30 years. But down the road at the exclusion zone checkpoint, the police officers ordered to be here are hoping for the best. You don't worry? Super safe. They told us that we're okay, so we just need to trust them. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Do you trust them? <laughs> <laughs> That's what our bosses say, so we need to trust our bosses, yes. But SafeCast believes people should trust in the data, and the more people who are gathering it, the better. Volunteers are designing a new, sleek, inexpensive Geiger counter that they hope to begin distributing in the spring. But the nonprofit is not stopping there or here. I think the goal really is when we started to try to solve the data scarcity problem about Japan, we realized that there was a systemic problem in the way that data is collected and disseminated and interpreted everywhere. That we're already starting to think about you know, how do we measure pollution, how do we measure all kinds of other things. And so I think a lot of things will come out of this, um, this incident. And so this democratization of science is really, really important in fixing the world's problems because it's not going to happen top down. Are you guys anti-nuclear or do you take a position? Or no. Just no, not at all. I mean, the, you're just pro -data. Uh, we just know that there's data that exists <laughs> and there's data that should exist and creating it, it, the data doesn't take a side one way or the other. And so if we just can get the data and give it to the people that are being immediately affected by it, then that's, that's a good thing. With light dimming, our Sunday drive for data ended here in the town of Katsurao, adding about 12,000 readings to a database of more than one and a quarter million. No one is here, only the police making sure we were not looters. And so it's hard to say if this lonely dog will ever see its owners again. Do we have anything to feed him? Sadly, no amount of data gathering can change that fact or erase this scene. We've launched something new on our science page online. It's called Science Thursday. Each week we'll feature a fresh video, slideshow, or blog post. Tonight, find photos and a story about the fate of dogs and cats abandoned in the exclusion zone. Plus, Miles talks with Hari about his reporting trip to Okay. Okay. What's going on? Come Yep. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, this was uh, a small uh, television segment, and it gives you kind of an idea of what, what happens in, in a nuclear fallout zone. As you could see, is there's lots of people are displaced, lots of uh, uh, people don't know what the radiation levels are. And what is interesting is, is I'm going to share with you a little bit later, what actually we measure uh, around Fukushima and other parts of Japan, and uh, I'm going to share that with you in a moment. Before that, I want to talk a little bit more about how we went about and how we uh, were able to uh, get to the point where we are right now. Uh, also, I'm going to share the screen again, if you could pick it up. Is it going? Uh, I'm seeing your desktop. I see your desktop now. Okay. Uh, you can see the SafePass logo right now. Huh? Ja, maar nu, maar nu zie ik nog dat zijschermetje erbij. Ja, oké, okay, nu is goed. All right. Oké, okay, so, and basically, uh, how, how we went about, um, you can see that in the three pictures here, the top picture to the right is the first device we built. This was literally what we put together in early April after the disaster. And it consists of a computer, a Geiger counter, and a small uh, Arduino board that was programmed to basically control uh, an interface between the Geiger counter and the GPS and, and the computer. Uh, the picture below is, is the first day we went to Koryama. Koryama is about 60, 70 kilometers away from the plant. And that's where we did our first measurements. Uh, the first measurements we did we were actually quite uh, surprised because the, the media had given an impression of much lower radiation levels and had done very, very limited measurement for obvious reasons. But when we went there with our system, we, we immediately noticed that radiation levels could vary dramatically over short distances but also very much higher than we all had anticipated. 
Um, Issa is uh, some of our volunteers uh, are working in a hackerspace in Tokyo on building the equipment. Uh, here you can see how the equipment goes in the car. And we spent quite some time thinking about this. One of the, uh, uh, the norm at that time was to put uh, Geiger counters inside the car for measuring in the environment. And that was kind of the norm up to uh, we came up with uh, this system. The other problem with a lot of the commercial available uh, systems that measure radiation is that they're not designed to be waterproof. So if you put something outside of a car, then if you put a piece of like, expensive equipment, you don't want it to be rained on. But we wanted our equipment to be uh, waterproof so that volunteers could drive any time of day without having to worry about the weather. So we, we basically uh, uh, put everything in a watertight box. Uh, in Japanese, uh, a lunch box is called a bento box. So we call this the bento uh, Geiger counter system. And here you can see two mounted on a car. And we use a very simple mounting technology, and basically in 5 to 10 seconds, you can mount this box on any car window. And we have mounted it on a wide, wide variety of all kind of uh, less fancy and very fancy cars. Uh, what is also possible is that you can uh, put the device on your uh, backpack and start uh, cycling with it. So we have had volunteers that literally have done that. Uh, this is the best car we ever had used for volunteer work. We had Tesla in Japan sponsor. Uh, <laughs> few cars that we used to measure inside Tokyo. Uh, this was obviously, we had suddenly much more volunteers uh, that wanted to join us. Uh, it's our uh, uh, Seipas car in action in Fukushima, the two of the devices on the car. Uh, I think our, ourselves, we covered about 50,000 kilometers ourselves in our own car. But more importantly, we have close to 50 uh, systems out in the field that are driven by 50 teams uh, almost day in and day out, and they collect a huge amount of data. Uh, here you can see in Iwaki. Iwaki is a city, it's about 35 kilometers from the plant in Fukushima. And the people in the middle are two volunteers that put it on their car. And in about a couple of weeks, they mapped the entire city of Iwaki, which is a city of about 200,000 people and a very, very large city. It's a, for, you know, probably 20 to 30 kilometer wide and very stretched out city. Uh, these are volunteers in another part of, of Fukushima that uh, were uh, evacuated from the uh, zone near the, near the plant and they volunteered to go back to their houses to measure their radar system. Uh, this is how the exclusion zone looks like. Uh, around the plant there is a 20 kilometer zone that is forbidden uh, entry by anybody. Uh, initially we were not able to enter, we measured around it. But as we progressed we teamed up with universities and other people that were able to take our equipment in. And uh, through that we have been able to measure everything inside the exclusion zone including up to the entrance of the damaged plant itself. Um, here you can see one of the researchers that is measuring in the uh, exclusion zone. And uh, because of uh, making measurements that were precise before uh, the system was uh, there to help them, they actually had to measure with a wagon counter and a uh, notebook and walk around and take notes of the radiation. With this system, they basically can do it automatically. And in many cases, they just can stay in the car rather than uh, expose themselves to uh, radi radioactive contamination. Uh, here you can see uh, a person in uh, Fukushima Prefecture that is using our map to see what the radiation level is at his, uh, at his own house. Uh, I'm going to skip here a little bit. Uh, uh, just for your information, uh, the, the time we have today is very limited, but besides measuring radiation with cars, we have done a tremendous amount of other measurements uh, through the last year and a half, including using spectrometers uh, to, to see what nuclides are in the environment, we have used chemical testing, we have used air filters, we have used a wide variety of other techniques to basically get better uh, understanding of the, uh, of the properties of the contamination that happened. In the beginning, there was nobody who knew actually what the materials were, and we went out with these spectrometers to actually uh, go straight in the environment to see what the contaminants were. Um, most of the contamination today is, is uh, radioactive cesium, uh, but in the weeks after the explosion, there, was, uh, there were components like uh, iodine and strontium that were active in the environment. Here you can see one of our uh, volunteers with an air uh, pump uh, that is used to collect air, air samples. Uh, we have measured all, on the ocean, and uh, we have uh, quite a lot of data. About uh, six months after we started, we had a one million locations measured with these devices. Uh, today we have measured over three and a half million locations, not only in Japan, but also outside of Japan. Uh, what is, uh, I think, amazing is, is that we started literally with one box that we put on a car, and uh, now, a year and a half later, we have collected three and a half million 
data points, and we're actually uh, still accelerating in the amount of data we're, we're, we're putting on the map. Uh, so this gives you an idea of the growth of, of locations we're measuring uh, or over, over time. Uh, midway through, we, uh, we basically started as a volunteer group that strictly is independent from any company or any government or any university. Uh, we want to provide really independent measurement. We want to collect the raw data and make it available uh, in the public domain to anybody that needs it. And one of the big problems after the disaster is that most of the data that was collected by either government, universities, or companies was not made public. So uh, maps were published, but there were purposes like PDF files, where you can see the end result, but no one was publishing their own data. Also, most people that were measuring were not publishing what equipment they were using. And unfortunately, radiation, the equipment that is available to measure radiation, uh, there are lots of different types of equipment, and they all measure slightly differently. So if you do that on a larger scale, you basically get quite a variance in the measurements. So from day one, we actually decided to only use one specific sensor for all our measurements, and even today, we use exactly the same sensor. So over time, we're able to compare very accurately how radiation levels are changing in the environment, uh, thanks to basically be very, very consistent in, in the measurement technique. Uh, as we moved up, and more and more people came to know about this, we got local cities in Fukushima that approached us to measure their city with our equipment. Uh, even though the government has been measuring radiation, they tended to measure only a few locations in the city, for example, the city hall or a school. Uh, but the funny thing is that most people don't live in the city hall or in the school, they actually live at their homes. And most people were worried about their direct homes and streets, and that's what they really wanted to measure. So we really fill the gap that the government or other companies were not able to fill, simply because they didn't have the ability to do it, they didn't have the ability to organize it, or uh, they didn't have the willpower to actually make it happen. Um, I'm going to switch a little bit now, and I'm going to try to show you our map. And uh, because we're going through Skype, I'm not sure how well it will work. So, plus, if you can give me feedback if it doesn't work, I would appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. First of all, uh, because we're we all are in Amsterdam, and I'm here in Tokyo. Uh, uh, I was in Holland uh, in Sump, and I measured. Uh, I took uh, a boat ride uh, across the canals of Amsterdam. And here you can see the results. So this is actually the raw data that we collect. And you, you know, it's a little bit difficult to see because there's lots of white dots on this map. You can see it, you know, in, in the rip, in you know, in the uh, in the lake, the eye. You can see uh, white dots. These are the actual measurements. And if you look at the left bottom on the screen, you can see clicks per minute. This is literally the amount of activations the Geiger tube has measured on that spot. That can be converted in uh, numbers like milliram or microseconds per hour. This would roughly translate to about 0 0.05 microsieverts. Even though there is no contamination per se in Amsterdam, uh, we measured slightly higher levels around uh, uh, the palace on the dam and some buildings around it, like the Bayekor and some other, uh, the first plan, etc. Most likely, though, I can't confirm it, this is because in uh, these tall buildings and big buildings, uh, granite uh, is probably used and red brick. Uh, these are uh, elements that are known to uh, be slightly radioactive, and that's probably what we picked up when we were uh, uh, not on the water. Um, so I want to uh, switch quickly to uh, our actual uh, actual map. So allow me a second. So the, the map that we have built, we have done it together with volunteers from MIT Media Lab in Boston. Um, one of the challenges that we had to overcome was how do we visualize uh, a three and a half or four million data points on the map. Uh, if you have some experience with trying to do this with Google, uh, you actually can't do it. it. It has limitations where you can't really drill down to a certain level and you're then confined to doing all kinds of tricks to make it work. So we developed some new technology to actually allow a huge data set to be uh, put on the map. What is also interesting is that you can see that on the right side is that we are, we are able to overlay other data sets on the map. So, we have a data set that shows all the earthquakes between 1973 and, and today, and we can overlay uh, earthquake centers on this map. Uh, the other overlay we have active right now is uh, nuclear reactors. Wherever you see a white dot, that's where a nuclear reactor is. And as you can see here, in the middle where the white circle is, that is where the Fukushima nuclear plant actually is. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And as, as, you, as you see, as I'm zooming in, the amount of detail keeps on uh, increasing. So as I keep on zooming in, it will 
show more and more data points. So I'm going to stop here a little bit and show a few data points. Uh, this is around the plant, so I'm going to click on the, the levels that we measured in front of the plant. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken here, around here. Uh, so we have a, a, a CPM count of 1050 microsieverts. This, this is, you know, we're seeing averages of 28 microsieverts or something like that. This, if you compare it to what we just saw in Amsterdam, uh, this would be uh, about 5,000 times more uh, background radiation than what you have right now uh, in Amsterdam. Um, here you can see that this line here that sits on the left side is the 20 kilometer exclusion zone. You can see some parts are still black because uh, that, that's actually a mountainous area. There's not much uh, road that goes through it. And now we're going to shift a little bit to the right. So we're now going into what is known as the outside of the 20 kilometer zone. And this is where actually uh, uh, partly people are still living, some areas are evacuated, but mostly people are living here. Uh, I'm going to go to the left side, left, uh, left top corner, where you see lots of purple and red and orange uh, colors. Uh, around, uh, these are the largest cities in Fukushima. There's about, you know, the area on the left where you see all the red and, and purple. This is about where maybe 70% of Fukushima uh, citizens live. There's about 1.45 million people in this area here. Uh, so, uh, what has happened is, is that you can see in between, uh, if I click uh, somewhere here maybe, uh, you can see that the value is about 0.2 microsieverts. This is close to the background, not perfect, but much further from the plant, about 70 kilometers away, you can see that the radiation levels are much higher, like for example, 1.2 microsieverts. And what has happened is, is that uh, because after the explosion, the, uh, the particles that were released by the plant actually traveled in various different ways through air. And they were carried by air and they were deposited by rain and snow. And the uh, fallout happened all the way up to Tokyo. So in Tokyo, we were able to measure uh, much lower levels, but still we could very, very clearly and easily measure contamination here. About maybe 20, 30 kilometers from Tokyo is, is an area called Chiba Prefecture. And uh, there we're measuring uh, already, you know, we can measure about uh, three to four times background versus Tokyo. So what is very important to understand is, is because the, the, the way the radiation contamination happened, it created a tremendous amount of blotchiness. And that blotchiness is what makes it very hard to actually talk about uh, how much contamination a person is exposed to. Because if we take an average for an area, then that average actually doesn't exist. You either are in a high area or a low area or whatever. So by measuring with our system, we were able to measure every 50 meters in Japan. So that's why we have so many measurements. So literally on the street, we measure around every 50 meters, 50 meters we have a measurement on the map to show. So people in Japan, they can punch in their zip code and the, the map zooms in. I'll show the radiation level. I'll do, I'll punch in my own zip code to see it works. Uh, I'm currently uh, in an area called Shibuya in, uh, uh, in Tokyo. Okay, so we'll take a few seconds, but here you can see this is Tokyo, and I can click on the value here uh, near where we are right now. I, I can see that the radiation level is 0.1 microsiever. Okay, uh, so I would like to... Peter, uh, yes. just for... Uh, uh, the, just to equate, can you type in the, the zip code of Amsterdam? Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, actually... The data that will be getting to our map is this fresh, okay. so it's not on the main map yet, so I have to apologize for that. Okay. Currently uh, uploading a, a lots of data sets that we recently have collected. Uh, our most important mission has been to churn, which we just got the device back and sitting next to me here. So we're, we're working on Europe. So we, we have people measuring in uh, Belgium, Holland, Norway, Chernobyl, and uh, we're trying to cover Luxembourg this time. Uh, we're actually looking for volunteers for France, uh, for obvious reasons, and the UK. Uh, so I would like to just uh, continue uh, very quickly uh, so that we can ask some questions. So we talked about the maps, and the maps are really uh, the way to visualize the data. But most importantly, the way we uh, disseminate data is you can go to our website and you can download a huge file that has all the data that is on the map. There's absolutely no filtering whatsoever. So researchers can use the data to do specific research on how radiation is changing over time in the environment. We have researchers that use it for making, uh, uh, you know, correlation between mental stress and radiation levels. Uh, we have uh, developers that have used uh, our uh, data to create small applets on iPhones or Android phones to show radiation as you move around. And actually what is very interesting is, is that uh, last week 
and the Fukushima government, where the plant is, uh, decided to use our data to show their citizens what the radi radiation levels are outside of Japan uh, as a comparison. And so uh, the, by making the data completely uh, transparent, by making the way we measure transparent, by making the measurements by ordinary citizens, we create a basically very reliable data set. Uh, and very interestingly, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there's anything else out there that can, uh, can, can get close to uh, can get close to that. Uh, so this is another example of a company that we work with. This is a company uh, that is Yahoo. Uh, we work with them to create a sensor network of 300 sensors that are fixed. And they're using uh, that to inform uh, their uh, people that come to the website as to what the trends are, you can click on it and you can see how it has changed over time. Uh, I'm going to skip through this, this is more about the devices and I would like to stop here, I think we're just perfectly 35 minutes, so I would like to see if you uh, have any interest. Uh, I would like to mention we're a 100% volunteer group, uh, we basically uh, collect money to uh, build and purchase equipment and have the cars drive. Uh, if you're interested to help out, uh, we do have uh, active volunteers all over the over the world that are helping us out with what we're doing. More recently, we have started a big project in the US to take the radiation measurements and instead of radiation, we're, we're, we're building devices uh, that are similar in, you know, in principle, but that can be used to measure air pollution. And uh, there, are, you know, based on what we have been doing over the last year or so, lots of people came to us and say, you know, why is there no air pollution map like radiation map? And actually we decided, you know, we can actually extend this uh, very easily. And we now have some volunteers that have taken that up. Uh, you can find more information on the website about what we're doing and uh, we're reasonably active in social media. So I would like to uh, thank you all for the for time and if you have some questions, I'm honored to answer them. Peter, you already answered my first question. Uh, about that? Sorry? Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, no it's, a, no, it's no problem. But I mean, that, that was the first thing I was personally th uh, thinking of. that. Uh, uh, why don't you measure more than just the radiation? But my second question is, uh, I am also active within OpenStreetMap in the Netherlands. And I was wondering if you have all the guys uh, driving around, can they just uh, also start uh, mapping uh, the, the streets of Japan for OpenStreetMap? Um, so OpenStreetMap, uh, interesting enough, we don't have a direct contact with OpenStreet. Uh, we'd love to do, so if you can help, it would be great. Yeah, I know uh, the guy who started it, so I'll, I'll try something to do. Uh, <laughs> sure, am I on the video or I wanted to yeah, show... Yeah, yeah, you, you are now on screen, personally. Right, but what I wanted to show is that you saw the, the boxes that went in the car, and you know, after a year or so, we, uh, we started to develop a much smaller size box, and now we're uh, having working on a prototype. You can see here, this is you know, my hand. It is about uh, one third or less the size of what we initially built. And uh, what we're trying to do right now is much more of these. And it's, it works very simple. If, if anybody wants to volunteer, we, uh, we provide the device at no charge. Uh, as long as you measure and share the data uh, until you get enough of it, and then you know, the device will come back. Uh, if, and in short, we have a few companies that have volunteered that, similar to OpenStreetMap, are driving every day to do geomapping or delivering uh, packages or mail or whatever. And through some of these um, you know, power volunteers, uh, we, we were able to uh, actually kind of jumpstart in some areas where it was hard to find volunteers or simply, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's also, you're also running against the time. If we spend too much time measuring, then uh, we miss out the opportunity to basically get snapshots of what happened and how does it change. And that is something which we're currently trying to uh, focus on by uh, our goal right now is, is to do the same measurement in the same location every six months. The other goal we have is, is to at least make a baseline of the planet, uh, which is a huge task, but we have started in the US and as, as I mentioned, we have started uh, a bit in Europe recently. But it all depends on volunteers that uh, need to step forward and say, you know, I'm, doing, I'm driving around randomly every day, so I'll just carry this device and I'll upload the data for you. Question. It's, uh, it's funny to see, uh, there's one question. It's funny to see that you start up the project the same way OpenStreetMap did because five, six years ago not everyone had a GPS uh, in possession. So we uh, got sponsorship for uh, all kinds of GPSs which people could use to drive around. And you're, you're uh, doing the same thing now with the Big ID boxes. So, uh, okay. but the, the, 
democratized. Anybody can buy fairly high quality gas now. Yeah. But, uh, you know, normally, you know, if there's no nuclear disaster, actually nobody needs a Geiger. So, yeah, so the maybe we should uh, do another disaster then, or? <laughs> <laughs> well, please, maybe it's good news, but uh, the problem is that there's no real market. So, you know, yeah. when, when, when there's a need, they basically are back work. Yeah. When everybody kind of settled yeah. down, there's no business. So, um, so, you know, we try to solve that problem by saying that, you know, not everybody needs to buy a Geiger account. But the, the, the device we use is about, that's about the euros, it's not cheap at all. Uh, and only to use it to measure your phone door is it's a little bit uh, prohibited. So by making it, you share a car resource, but in a way that is basically uh, designed for anybody to use. You know, the, the, the skill to use, if you know how to use a camera, uh, then you know how to use this system. It's basically, you have to pull up the card and stick it in your PC and move a file to it. So it, it's really, made really, really simple. Can't you uh, ask uh, Tim Cook to integrate a Geiger counter in iPhone 6 or something? And everybody yeah. uh, is laying down before shops. Yeah, so we did that. But yeah. uh, the, there we is one question. Oh. I used with the MacBook Air and everything, but at that time, as everybody knows, that probably doesn't do that much uh, of charity uh, work at the moment, so that didn't work. But we got some gals. Um, so. <laughs> there, there is one question. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, and maybe well, I can repeat to, it. To be precise on that, I did build uh, at that time a, a device that you can attach to your iPhone and turn it into a Geiger counter. And I'll type this for you. If you search the web for iGuide, uh, and literally spell it like this, or iGuide.com, you'll go to a website where you can see some of the stuff that I built about a year and a half ago. Uh, okay, more. Please email me. Uh, sorry, the, the, the uh, it's iGuide. I K A E K E. Oh, I can I can share it. Um, okay, yeah. But um, there's one question for you. Yes. So uh, especially as more things than just radiation gets uh, measured by more people, how do we trust the data? Uh, I'll repeat your question. Yes. Uh, Peter, as uh, as more things than just radiation are being measured, how do we? Uh, how do we ensure the quality of the data? I mean, how do we uh, know that uh, there are not people from, uh, for example, the Secret Service putting in false positives or negatives? It's a very good question. And the way from that is, is first of all, uh, we try to have uh, the same area covered by multiple people. Uh, the way it works is the volunteers uh, don't know each other. They volunteer freely on the internet to work with the devices. So if somebody wants to, uh, or wants to put in uh, fake measurements or the device is broken, then it will kind of be co co corroborated by people that have the other measurements. So for example, if you see a consistent pattern that one guy always has high measurements or low measurements, then either the device is broken or he put it in a lead shield or he put a source on it or something like that. So the idea is, is you know, in order to make it work, you need to have some minimal critical mass of maybe 20, 30 uh, independent people that are measuring the through that system, you can keep everybody honest. Another thing we don't do is, is we do not accept any money if it comes with any condition. So we completely do what we like, uh, and that leads to measure independently. So we don't have uh, any other charge for them to, to measure and disseminate. And that attracts people that in general appreciate that openness. And so far, to be very, you know, to be very uh, uh, clear, so far we have not had that problem, but we have thought about it. So we keep on uh, looking at the data, and if there's something strange, then we can go and go back there and we measure in the open street. So you can always go to the street again and measure it again and say, you know, there was nothing here. So if you if you are a government agency and say, you know, we're going to drive around with lots of this equipment and, and pretend there is nothing there, uh, then, you know, we will very quickly, uh, you know, discover that. So it's, so it's, it's reasonably foolproof uh, to be practical. I, I know that in open street map, I heard a story that uh, at one time, uh, uh, one person committed the whole uh, street map of Estonia. And so, uh, uh, although Estonia is not a very big country, it was not very uh, plausible that uh, he uh, would have driven uh, or walked uh, completely Estonia in, uh, on his own. So, uh, that, that was within our street map one of the things that people started thinking, hey, maybe this is someone who uh, just uploads uh, a proprietary map in an open street map. But I guess uh, you are also going to get experience with these things. Uh, are there, sorry? It's, we will have some certain type of, of so 
But the whole idea is, is that, you know, by not depending, you know, you can look at a, at a data spot that is measured to the location. We show on that spot how many measurements are done by whom, yeah. including if the time was anonymous or a named person or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a, you know, as a netizen, you can decide yourself if you, uh, if you uh, believe that number or not. So, like anything on the internet, you will have to draw your own conclusions, you will still have to do homework, but at least we can provide you tons of data uh, about something that was literally unavailable uh, a year and a half ago. And as I mentioned, it's not so easy to, to pick it. If we would get, uh, for example, uh, a set from the Russian government or from the Chinese government or whatever, we'll still upload it, but we'll, you know, it will be marked as Chinese government, so you, you make your own conclusions. I suggest uh, one question more if there is one. Are there questions? No? One, one, one. Yeah, oh, yeah. How quick is this? Uh, this was the flag. Sorry, Peter? I'm not sure if you can see on the screen. Yeah, yeah, well, we saw it. I, I, I already opened it in the browser, the oh. iGuide.com. So, interestingly enough, nobody actually built something that uh, was very much like it. But what happened after this, lots of people copied the idea and made uh, a device that was kind of stick, stick uh, with a wire on it and a battery. It did, become a kind of a popular way to measure radiation and companies that build devices like this uh, uh, on a commercial level. So, okay. I was we share the idea and, and people can, uh, can copy it and do something with it. There's one last question. Uh, how quickly yes. do the measurements change after a rainfall or after something else? Like, uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, 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 how quick do measurements change after rainfall, snowfall, or a storm, or whatever? Yes, it's a very quick question, and uh, I can only partially answer it because I think we only starting to understand now what is happening. Uh, there's a few uh, mechanisms that are there. Uh, first of all, you have the half-life of uh, particles, and the half-life is only uh, uh, kind of a good indicator for particles that have short half-lives. So for example, things like iodine or whatever, that has a half-life of seven days, literally in seven days it starts really to drop down and after a couple of weeks it's barely measurable. But cesium or strontium that have half-lives of about 28 to 30 years, they have a very different uh, effect because basically they, they keep on radiating. Uh, the radiation levels not change because of the half-life so much, uh, it changes how the, the contaminated material uh, moves uh, uh, in the environment. So, for example, rain will uh, move things around. But what is very important to understand is cesium is a highly reactant chemical, so it, it tends to react with any silicate. So what happens is sand or, or concrete or roofs or whatever, the moment the, uh, the cesium gets in contact with it, it basically uh, uh, creates a coating that is like, you know, it's like a glaze, so it's almost impossible to get it off. So that stuff, uh, uh, has sticks on, on things. That's why, for example, roofs in contaminated areas are radiating a lot because the roofs have absorbed it and it doesn't come off. But what does happen though is, is that as there is wear and tear of rain, uh, snow, and other elements, um, particles still are being transported and either concentrated or diluted. So there's areas that are decreasing much faster than the half life, but there's also areas where the stuff that is basically uh, transported by rain or other things or wind where they concentrate. So we, we're seeing super hot spots where there's areas where it, is, where it is actually leveling off more than what we had anticipated or what you know, the half-life would have dictated. And uh, for example, if you're in the mountains and the mountain is contaminated, then the contaminants tend to slowly work themselves down. But if there is a road that becomes kind of a blockage, then the road becomes a high, a high hot spot because the road basically uh, concentrates the sterilicals from down the mountain. And uh, this is still, I think, an area that needs lots of uh, further study and research. And uh, uh, I think our data set is probably going to be one of the data sets that hopefully can give us a much better idea as to what is the kind of ecological half-life of contaminants versus the, uh, uh, the half-life of the, of the particles themselves. And there, I think, you know, uh, I've seen locations where, uh, surprisingly, we have seen leveling off up to a factor, uh, you know, 60% or 70% leveling off where, you know, we thought it would level more than 10 to 20 percent by now. So there, there is some mixed news, but there is also some good news in that. I, uh, I think it's best to now uh, stop. Yes. So uh, it means uh, that we are uh, thanking you for giving your presentation.
Um, unfortunately, unfortunately uh, we can't send uh, a bottle of wine through Skype. <laughs> so, um, ceremonically, I, uh, I am now uh, <laughs> handing you over the bottle of wine. You'll, you'll hear the crisping. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, so, we, we thank you a lot for uh, giving this presentation. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> people want to get in contact with you, they can go to safecast.org yep. or they can send me an email and I will send more info, but it's all, all is on the website and uh, I heard from you that Safecast is looking for volunteers in the Netherlands. Yes, it, oh, uh, we met in Holland or, uh, you know, uh, around Barcelona and a few measurements that would be wonderful. Also, people that want to help out in other areas, like uh, on the software or the mapping, or just take something, take the day and do something a bit for research, it would all be very, very useful. Okay, that's uh, great. Uh, go uh, to the website and there's more info. Let's keep it. Why not? I'll try to visit you when I'm in Holland next time and we'll have a while. Okay, yeah, yeah, that would be great. Uh, I, I hope it, uh, it will be fast. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, Thank you. We are now here going to have a break. And yes. um, we thank you for, uh, for your voluntary uh, contribution to uh, uh, making Japan a little bit more uh, doorzichtig, uh, transparent on, uh, on data measurements. It's my pleasure and thank you very much for all your time uh, and I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much.